I'm not a big fan of separating neurological and surgical conditions. I think only together we are strong. I think it's a patient condition that needs to be treated interdisciplinary. Hello, welcome to Myelopathy Matters, the official podcast of the charity myelopathy.org, where we talk all things degenerative cervical myelopathy from the perspective of the professionals, the researchers, and the people living with myelopathy. I'm Ben Davies, neurosurgeon scientist and a founder of myelopathy.org. I'm Ewan Sadler, a person with DCM and also a founder of myelopathy.org. This is Myelopathy Matters. So today we are joined by members of the Diagnostic Criteria Incubator for an update and some interesting early perspectives. What is the background to this? Well, you may recall that myelopathy.org with AO Spine undertook a global initiative to identify the top priorities to advance care and outcomes in DCM. And if you weren't aware, you can listen back in a special podcast series. But amongst those priorities was the need to create some diagnostic criteria. I know this is a priority very close to your heart, I believe, Ewan. Yes, definitely. I mean, if there's one thing that our entire community from the support group share with us, it's difficulty including delays and accessing a diagnosis. I can't thank Aospine enough for what they have done to get myelopathy on the map when it comes to research. And I don't think people realise how big the charity's involvement is when it comes to this. And their support, AO, this is, continues because identifying a problem is one thing, but ultimately... We need to find some answers. So as an extension to the RICO DCM initiative, we've now formed some international working groups targeting specific research priorities. And this included a panel of people working to create the first diagnostic criteria for DCM. And let's hear how they're getting on. So I'm delighted today to be joined by Konstantinos Margetis, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery at ICANN at Mount Sinai University, New York. And also Dr. Carl Zipser, neurologist at the Spinal Cord Injury Center, Balgrist University Hospital, Switzerland. And we're going to be discussing the work and efforts of, of these two uh, with many others. And also we must mention Dr. Lindsay Tetro, uh, a resident in neurology also from, from New York, who's been heavily invested in this project, trying to tackle forming some diagnostic criteria for, for DCM. So perhaps I can start with you, Konstantinos. Uh, perhaps from a spine surgeon's perspective, why do you think we need diagnostic criteria? The first reason I think is that this diagnostic criteria will allow us to make an earlier diagnosis of the, of the disease. And we know very well that surgery, which is the only treatment that we have right now for, for this disease, it can uh, prevent uh, the further deterioration of, uh, of the clinical symptoms, but uh, it doesn't always reverse the symptoms, doesn't always bring the patient back to a normal status. So making an earlier diagnosis and uh, treating the disease earlier on can have like a significant uh, clinical uh, benefit. The second reason is that hopefully this diagnostic criteria will allow us to make a better use of our resources because uh, it's, um, it's it's very, very essential to in order to make the diagnosis of uh, DCM to get uh, some kind of advanced imaging and uh, magnetic resonance uh, uh, imaging is the, the main imaging modality that we currently use. And MRI is not that, uh, let's say, low cost uh, examination. And um, uh, that can be an issue in both areas where the resources are not limited, but also in areas where the resources are, are more limited. And what's your perspective, Carl, from, from a neurologist's uh, side of the fence? I can just agree to what Konstantinos already said regarding the clinical management. I think first and foremost, we hope to improve the management and um, refer patients to timely diagnosis and therapy. And um, I may also add that. DCM diagnostic criteria would also be important to streamline research because what we what we saw during our literature reviews is that in spine research there are many different inclusion criteria used for DCM and this makes the comparison and generalizability between studies very difficult and it also makes it very difficult to interpret the results from studies where different conditions are mixed. So when you have studies uh, who mix up myelopathy, radiculopathy, or asymptomatic spine stenosis. And we believe that with more homogeneous study cohorts, research in DCM can be much more efficient. 
And if I may add one last perspective, uh, I think, which is really important is the medical curriculum. Because when I remember my medical curriculum, degenerative spine disease were lectured in a very general way, but there was no specific teaching of the dangers of untreated DCM. And I think the saying, you only diagnose what you know, holds particularly true for DCM. So I think uh, with a diagnostic criteria for DCM, we have high chances also to improve the quality of the medical curriculum. So, Constantinus, what's your approach today in practice without the benefit of a diagnostic criteria? How do you approach a diagnosis of, of DCM? So the process of diagnosis starts with a clinical suspicion. The, the healthcare professional needs to have, to have a high level of clinical suspicion and to evaluate the symptoms of the patient that, uh, you know, the hand dexterity issues or the balance issues might be related to, uh, to DCM. So once we have the, the, the clinical suspicion, then uh, we do a thorough neurological exam and uh, we're looking for the typical, you know, uh, myelopathy signs like Hoffman sign, you know, Babinski sign, hyperreflexia. But, um, you know, the, these signs are basically present in, at least in my experience, in advanced stages of the disease. Uh, in earlier stages of the disease, the neurological examination can be quite an unimpressive. You might pick up some gait uh, uh, unsteadiness, but you don't always get the full set of clinical signs that we see in our textbooks. But if the clinical suspicion, the symptoms are, are you know, are suspicious, then uh, the next step is to get um, imaging. And um, the, the main imaging modality that we use is uh, MRI. And uh, if the MRI uh, confirms that uh, there is stenosis, uh, then uh, we can we can make the diagnosis of uh, DCM. What I would like to add is that the diagnosis can get very very tricky sometimes. There are systemic diseases like diabetes, or just you know general deconditioning of the patient that uh, can cause symptoms that can mimic the symptoms of cervical myelopathy. Uh, patients can um, can have uh, gait unsteadiness or can have some kind of uh, feeling of clumsiness in in, in their hands. And many times, you know, we are able to to make a diagnosis um, with the help of our neurology colleagues. But there are many instances where we're still left with many unknown parameters. And uh, we, we still don't know to what degree the symptoms are caused by the systemic disease and to what degree the symptoms are caused by, by DCM. And I think it's very interesting that you articulate very clearly, this is difficult and this is not easy making a diagnosis. And I think reflects on the widespread underdiagnosis and certainly the delays we face. And also that quite clearly shows that one of the big challenges here is we haven't got a specific test. You know, there's not a nice blood test that goes, yes, this is myelopathy or, or no. And that imaging isn't the, the panacea that we would hope it could be. And I just wonder, Carl, uh, looking at your perspective from neurology, where quite often that is the scenario, you haven't got those specific tests, you know, whether there are lessons we can take from neurology practice in that, in that regard. From a neurological perspective, I fully understand the focus on imaging and surgery because in the end, you cannot operate what you do not see. And in neurology, this is very different because you cannot see all conditions. So our our mindset is uh, is very familiar with diseases that you cannot see or that you cannot visualize. I mean, take, for example, migraine. This is a condition which is mainly uh, diagnosed from patient reports. So we are not too much relying on the imaging and we are relying much more on the neurological examination and history taking, which has the highest priority. Because in the end, only when you understand the syndrome, you know what diagnostic tests to, to have best. What I really like about the, the recode setting and also about the, the cooperation in DCM research is that we can really learn from each other. So the surgical and the neurological community. And in the end, in particular for such conditions which are overlapping between the disciplines, I think only together we are strong. And let's say... I'm not a big fan of separating neurological and surgical conditions. I think it's a patient condition that needs to be treated interdisciplinary. I think that brings us nicely onto the framework you've recently proposed um, and will soon be, be published. Perhaps you could introduce that to us and how that can help us here. DCM basically needs to be a clinical diagnosis with the MRI confirming. If you just take the two extremes, that there is no imaging correlate and still symptoms, we need to rule out other causes, as Constantinos already uh, said. And on the other hand, if we have severe stenosis on imaging, but no symptoms of DCM, we cannot make this diagnosis of DCM. So therefore, I think it's really important to create a framework that uh, defines the role of imaging. 
So we developed the framework with the diagnostic incubator team from Recode. And to my understanding, it should be a first guidance of how to frame the diagnostic criteria. It is based upon an analysis of the diagnostic criteria, which are often used in neurology. And we found when looking, when screening through diagnostic criteria used in neurology, we think that the role of imaging can be basically broken down to ruling in a diagnosis, for instance, in intracranial bleeding. When you have intracranial bleeding, you see it on the CT or MRI scan, you have the diagnosis of intracranial bleeding, whatever symptoms you have. But you also have many conditions where MRI or other neuroimaging is just supporting the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis, for example, in multiple sclerosis. Then you have other conditions which are using imaging mainly to rule out differential diagnosis, for example, in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is mainly a clinical and partly neurophysiological diagnosis, and then you just use the MRI to rule out uh, other causes. And for other diseases, for example, in migraine, in some cases, MRI can be just be perceived as being optional. And I think when we have to sort in DCM, it's more like resembling the diagnostic structure that is used in multiple sclerosis, so where clinical and imaging signs are required to make the diagnosis. But also for ruling out differential diagnosis for this, it's also very important. I thought the framework was incredibly eloquent, and I think it has a real value here in, in not just helping to support you know, the the implementation of how you diagnose is, but you know we've got a real issue in education gap here, both from from our colleagues and professionals who are still in a position where we thought that the MRI is perhaps that it's a black or white assessment, but also I think people with myelopathy because I think for them the idea that the that, that the medical test isn't perfect that it cannot give them all of the answers is something that isn't not necessarily their preconception it can be quite a, a gap to overcome in a clinical setting is that something you've experienced do you, you, you foresee that same same opportunity there yeah absolutely i when i when i talk to my colleagues now and also when i talk to patients i think that the the framework has a very high educative value for colleagues when when i present it uh, I think they, they understand that such an approach of seeing DCM as a clinical diagnosis with MRI supporting is a good requirement for providing optimum treatment in the end. Because if done differently, if you just rely on imaging, in the end, patients with, with severe imaging findings may be just operated, whatever symptoms they have, while patients who have very mild imaging findings in the end may not undergo surgery because you only look on the imaging. So I think a differentiated view is very important. And for patients in the end, it's also very important that they are aware that what you see on the imaging is not necessarily what you have in the end, so that they understand that they still may have symptoms despite having only mild findings on their MRI. And do you think the the role of imaging in, in DCM will change over time? Is this something that's good? You know, is this framework? So there's a framework about the role of imaging, but perhaps the position of of, of myelopathy in that framework may evolve. Yeah, I I, th I think and I, I hope that advanced imaging will play a stronger role in diagnosing mild DCM in the future. So I think, and also with with all of the team and the and the Recode group, I think there are some cases where the diagnosis is pretty clear where you have matching clinical symptoms and MRI and you know what to do. But the, the patients which are at risk are these patients who have mild symptoms and mild imaging findings. Uh, so to speak, these patients with only mild MRI findings might in the future benefit from microstructural imaging, dynamic spinal cord imaging, and if you find abnormalities there, they might be referred to surgery earlier. So our, let's say, how, how we coin it is that we have a shift from just visualizing the stenosis to actually, um, to actually evaluate the spinal cord distress. And this is what, what we hope for with other advanced imaging. And I think that picks up lots of the points that Constantine is making about the, the potential risk of health inequalities here and the cost of some of these tests because if you can really work out those subgroups that that there is uncertainty with you know we've got a framework in place that's the group that there remains uncertainty therefore these additional tests are required 
then you've certainly got a much more streamlined uh, process, I would think. So, Constantinus, returning, returning to you, perhaps you could give us a bit of an update about, about how we're approaching uh, the formation of diagnostic criteria here. Yes, yeah, sir. So we have formed a working group under the AO Spine Recode um, Initiative. And uh, in that group, uh, we have representation from multiple groups of people. It's not just a multidisciplinary uh, group of uh, doctors, but we have other healthcare professionals like physical therapists. And of course, we also include uh, people with uh, DCM. And uh, we listen very, very carefully to what people with DCM have to say about the process that we're, we're following. The working group, you know, tried to approach uh, the formation of criteria with um, methodological rigor, and uh, we have come up with uh, a multi-step uh, process. The, the first step in the process is to thoroughly review the literature. So we have a couple of, actually several scoping reviews in, uh, in progress right now. Uh, one of these uh, reviews is aiming to um, extract all the symptoms that they're associated with DCM. Another one is looking for the signs associated with DCM. Another one is looking for the definitions that have been used by the authors uh, about what is DCM. And, um, and, uh, and uh, uh, in, in that definition, we're also looking for the diagnostic criteria that the authors used in order to make the diagnosis of DCM. So this is the, the first step to thoroughly re review the literature. And, um, you know, it, it's a very, you know, very ambitious goal because there are several thousand publications on, on the subject. Uh, but we have been fortunate to have uh, a big group of, uh, of people that they're willing to, to help us with that goal. The, the next step is uh, to use the appropriate use criteria that were developed by uh, RAND uh, institution in early 2000. So this uh, appropriate use criteria they quantify from one to nine how appropriate it is to order a diagnostic test or to offer a therapeutic uh, intervention. So we're using that methodology uh, for, for our purposes. And uh, what we plan to do is come up with um, uh, several clinical scenarios and then ask a group of experts to evaluate if it was appropriate to uh, make the diagnosis of DCM or, or not appropriate. And the next step after that will be to prospectively evaluate the criteria that will develop in a clinical setting. And we plan to do that in multiple clinical uh, settings in order to ensure that the results and whatever conclusions we'll come up uh, with, uh, they're generalizable to multiple environments. So this is, this is the plan that we have right now. Thanks, Carl. And I think it's easy to say, wrap that up in a few minutes, but that is a, that's a big undertaking. That's a big project. It's going to take some, some time to get through those steps and um, to produce those results, isn't it? Yes, for sure, yeah. And we, we think that, you know, it, it's necessary to do that. We, we, we don't think that there is an easier way to, to do that if we want to maintain the rigor in, in, uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. And I think the rigor is so important if you want to get the buy-in. You know, people, it's very easy to get people around a table in a room and make some decisions, isn't it? But no one will have that opportunity to engage and see that process and to buy in. I think that implementation phase is, is going to be critical. But perhaps turning to you both, Carl and, and Constantinus, what, what do you think, what do you foresee as the other challenges that we might face in, in this process? I think one very important message we need to we need to transfer through our work is that uh, diagnosis of DCM and treatment decisions are two separate issues because uh, we do not want to get like misunderstood that we think that a patient with a diagnosis of DCM necessarily lead uh, surgical treatment because I think that not not every patient with DCM needs immediate surgery. And in some patients who have like severe asymptomatic stenosis, they may need surgery. This is a very, let's say, controversial and very individual decision in the end. But I think this needs to be clear because uh, some, in particular surgeon, I, I would be interested in, in your opinion about this, uh, Constantinos. So when I talk to our surgeons, for example, they, they have a very different view. So me as a neurologist, I see the symptoms and I see the degree of spinal cord stenosis. But for the surgeons, there are like many more um, aspects important from the imaging. So let's say instability or let's say uh, specific reasons for uh, spinal cord narrowing, uh, spinal canal narrowing. So um I think there really needs to be, for the treatment decision in the end, a very differentiated view and very, very well prepared algorithms. What do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, so th there are some additional uh, unknown factors, some, let me call them known unknown factors that 
you know, factors that we, we, we know that we don't know them. And although they're not directly related to the goal of, uh, of this project, but uh, they definitely um, have a close interaction with, with our goal. So just a few questions. I mean, um, you know, we were planning to come up with diagnostic criteria that hopefully will allow us to diagnose the condition at an early stage. But we don't know what is the natural history of the early TCM. You know, if, if it's going to remain stable for many years, then probably we don't need to do any kind of surgery, but wait for when the clinical symptoms be, become worse. And uh, what will be the earliest point in uh, the natural history of the disease that should indicate the surgical intervention? And how invasive or how extensive that surgical intervention uh, should be, because we have some options that they are a little bit more invasive than the others. So uh, I think that uh, as we proceed with that goal, I think that we will have to eventually tackle with these known unknowns. But uh, I think there are several unknown unknowns that will also come up as we as we go through the, you know this this project. I think this is really interesting because it picks up on, I think, one of the other big challenges here, which is that between creating a framework which is going to accurately pick up all cases of DCM, whether it be mild or severe, against something that's not uh, so non-specific that actually we're getting a lot of noise from other conditions or mimics of, of DCM and how we tease that apart. What, what are your perspectives on that? Yeah, it's, it's it's really a challenge, these these very early DCM patients and to to determine what their stress level is. So do they really have caught distress or do they just have stenosis with like mild ongoing disease without risk to deteriorate? I think one important issue is for in ter- with regards to the diagnostic criteria, I think if we have if we have established those criteria, it will be much easier to have larger registries of DCM patients and then to really follow up these patients over years to see from, let's say, an epidemiological point of view or um, from a follow-up point of view, just clinical, who is deteriorating and who is staying stable. So I think what you're starting to unpick there is that that this framework, this diagnostic criteria is really going to probably be the entry point to what hopefully over our lifetime will become a much more complicated, but you know, globally representative framework of you know, how you proceed from that point. Yeah, definitely. I think this is ju- this is just the start. So from my experience now with Recode is that it's a rapidly evolving and very active community. And I'm certain that the common effort uh, of this community is long lasting. And I, I'm pretty sure that um, the diagnostic criteria, or let's say the framework, the basis laid for the diagnostic uh, criteria will last longer and then merge into further research on this topic. Did you have any additional reflections, Konstantinos? Yeah, I would also like to add that with any, let's say, set of criteria, we end up with a balance between how sensitive or how how specific this framework is. Um, and if we want something to be a very, very sensitive, then we should, you know, we'll be able to diagnose the disease in all the patients who have it, but we might also make an erroneous di- diagnosis on patients who, who don't have it. On the other hand, we, we try to be very, very specific, then we might miss some of uh, the patients that uh, do have the disease, but erroneously, you know, be classified as uh, non-DCM. So that balance can, can get very, very tricky. And actually, we might need to come up with different balance between these two factors for, for different patient populations, you know, might there might not be just one, let's say, general set of diagnostic criteria. We might, we might need to be a little bit more specific for, for some subgroups of, uh, of patient populations. That's a very interesting point. I just wonder, Carl, from, from the neurology perspective, where you often deal with these diseases which have less specific tests, is there anything we can learn there? I think you've talked previously about the idea that you have a, a suspected a DCM as opposed to confirmed DCM, if you like. What I think is that... When you have diagnostic criteria for DCM, you also have also defined what you would not call a DCM. And this could be a good start to follow up these patients, which you would not call DCM yet. So where you just have like a suspicion, but you do not have the clear diagnosis. And I think we can learn from the neurological community in conditions such as multiple sclerosis, for example. This really important, so there is no intention to compare multiple sclerosis and DCM in terms of the physiology. It's totally a different mechanism. 
But let's say from the dynamics of the research field and also from the diagnostic structures, it's, it's strongly resembling. For example, in, in multiple sclerosis at the beginning, let's say in the 80s, you just had criteria for multiple sclerosis. And in the 90s, in the beginning of the 2000s, you have like the, the separation of, for example, clinical isolated syndrome, which is like a clinical form of multiple sclerosis without uh, imaging confirmation and also radiological isolated syndrome, which is a radiological diagnosis without the clinical signs. And this might be an interesting future perspective to define not only DCM, but also to define the pre-stages. And this will be very challenging, but I'm, I'm quite confident that we can get there with more knowledge and uh, with following our path. So what are your take-homes from listening to this update, Ewan? It really gives me hope for the future of the diagnostic criteria for myelopathy. This important information can then be passed down to the other health professionals, resulting in reduced diagnosis and treatment time. In a recent blog I wrote for myelopathy.org called Was It All In My Head, I highlighted some of the difficulties that we come across, which makes the whole diagnosis process a lot more difficult. I think most people with myelopathy have done it at some point, is you book an appointment to see the doctor, your symptoms are playing up, only to find when it comes to the appointment, your symptoms are no longer there. So yes, it makes you start questioning things about your diagnosis. I think that's a really interesting perspective and um, it sort of captures something that I've been trying to work out for some time now because I think, you know, you know general practitioners don't want to miss diagnosis. They're there to try and help, help people for sure. And I think there is an awareness at a textbook level about this condition, but in practice, they're having great difficulty in applying that knowledge into, you know, people with, with myelopathy. And I guess that variation in symptoms may be a part of it. But, but I think fundamentally, we haven't been able to tell them what they should be looking for. And that's what this process is, is really about. And I think from my side, I think also it's really important that this is a process that we support and we do it right because we don't want this to be wrong. This has got to be done you know, iteratively really get to exactly what this needs to be because we want to get behind something that we should push out to all these professionals that's right. It's not going to change and update in a few years' time. It's absolutely right. But that does mean it's going to take some time, and I think that comes across in this process. This is something that's being driven by a, a multidisciplinary group from around the world, and it's going to take time to get into practice and to be sure that it is the right framework. But ultimately, as you've heard from Ewan, as you've heard throughout the process from the community, this is absolutely a fundamental question we need to answer because unless we diagnose people early, we cannot offer treatment at the right time. And we do know that surgery, its effectiveness is determined by how long somebody has been living with the condition. So how can the people with DCM contribute and get involved? Well, right now we have representatives from Myelopathy Support and the Myelopathy.org community invested in this project. And um, I think the, the, the way to stay in touch with this project is to just keep an eye on the website, look for the updates that come out sort of quarterly about where things are. At some juncture, there is going to be a need to tap into the community and to really check in with, you know, is this diagnostic framework something that would have worked for you? Um, but I think at this stage, we are much more sort of uh, formative industrial sort of research phase and we haven't yet reached that point so i think in short keep an eye on the on the website on the podcasts uh, and we will certainly advertise that opportunity when it arises and of course another way of keeping in touch is to join our official facebook support group myelopathy support a community for people living with myelopathy where we can share all the regular updates as well so what's up next month? Well, we're talking to Chad Cook, Professor of Physical Therapy from Duke University, United States, because he's been looking at how common pain that interferes with everyday life is in degenerative cervical myeloma. Thanks very much to our guests, Carl Zipser and Konstantinos Margetis. This was Myelopathy Matters from myelopathy.org. The podcast was produced by Carl Homer from Cambridge TV. To keep up to date with the latest in the field of degenerative cervical myelopathy, why not subscribe on your favourite podcast app, where you'll also find all of our previous episodes. There's of course lots more information to be found about the condition at myelopathy.org. But if you've got a question about myelopathy or an experience to share, we'd love to hear it. Please get in touch at ben at myelopathy.org. But until next time, goodbye.